Christine Jacobsen is the chief economist and current CEO of Saxo Bank. He has more than 25 years of overall experience in the banking sector, but especially in propriety trading and alternative investments. Um, he studied economics at the University of Copenhagen, where he also took his first job at the local Citibank. And after that followed very many influential jobs in leading positions at institutions such as Chase Manhattan, um, the Chase Manhattan Propriety Trading Group, and the Swiss Bank Corporation, all in London. He was also in New York, where he worked for the institution called Christiana and the UBS. Um, he worked for the Global Propriety Group, uh, and now he's at Sexo Bank, where, as I said, he's the chief economist and CEO. So you can see he has lots of experience in uh, the world of finance, in the banking system, and he's going to use this experience now to tell you something about the current state of the Euro crisis. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Steen Jacobsen. Thank you very much. It's a double challenge to speak after lunch and then speaking in such a beautiful weather. I'm uh, normally introduced to someone who's predicted five of the last two crises. So if any of you have a tendency to depression, now is the time to leave. The state of Europe could just as well be the state of, Euro of the world because in an average year, I go to about 35 countries, and I can make the speech I'm going to make to you in 33 of those 35 countries. But let's see, and let's get started on where are we actually? 20 years ago, we had Johnny Cash, Bart Hope, and Steve Jobs. Now we have no cash, no hope, and no jobs. And as it says at the end, let's hope Kevin Bacon doesn't die, because then we have no breakfast, and that would be terrible. I like to say when I talk to investors and hedge funds around the world that I'm the most optimistic I've been in 25 years of doing this job. For one reason only. I think it's simply impossible to get worse. 26 years ago, we celebrated the fall of the Berlin Wall. At the time, I'm unfortunately old enough to remember, we were celebrating the fact that the market-based economy prevailed over the planned economy. 26 years later, we have the Soviet Union of Europe. There's not a single asset class in, in Europe that trades freely. All of it is government or quasi-government uh, intervention. We have zero interest rate, zero inflation, and to a large extent among the youth, zero hope. But having said that, if you look at the evolution of history, it's very clear that something needs to break before you can start anew. Never in history has the politician been wise enough to, to proactively seeking in a solution. They have at all times been playing the games which is called pretend and extend, pretend you're credible, and extend by buying time. So as any good economist, I came up with uh, economic theory. And I have to say, the Nobel Prize in Economics has just been given, and I was very disappointed not to get a phone call. So I've been thinking, why is my economic theory actually attracting enough attention? And I think there are two main reasons. The first one is, it actually works. Even worse, it can actually explain what goes on. And the second reason, well, think about it. The Nobel Prize is given in Stockholm. There's never ever in time anything being given to a Dane from the Swedes, so I think that's probably the biggest reason. <laughs> so the Bermuda Triangle in economics explains why we are in the situation we're in. What is the Bermuda Triangle economics? It is the fact that we have high unemployment, low productivity, extremely high stock market valuation, and record high unemployment, all at the same time. It may be 30 years ago I attended university, but I don't think the textbook has changed that much. So it is a true dilemma we're dealing with. The fact that we have one part of the economy, the paper money, doing the best ever. Meanwhile, Main Street, the average guy, the average household, the poor, the middle income, has never been worse off. The reason we can keep that in place is twofold. One, you are the second generation of what I call the entitlement kids. 
you never really work for anything. You're given everything, but worse, you are the most average, the most boring, the most bland generation in history. Look at you. 80-90% of you have a Samsung. 80-90% of you go onto Google and think that is the answer to everything, despite the fact you know everything is sponsored. You all want to be bankers, despite the fact that it is the most lost cause in history to be a banker these days. The ladies, Gucci, the newspapers, Iron Rand is the savior. You all have the same opinion. You go to the same cafes, you read the same newspapers. Media has never been more one-sided. Of course, I'm not judging you as a social experiment, but you have to remember that growth, productivity, comes not from being average. It comes from having a wide spectrum, allowing the art existence on the far left, on the far right to prevail. When I go to Paris, I like to say that Gérard Gibardieu is the biggest national hero in French history. And the French journalists look at me in horror. How can you say that? Well, first of all, he puts focus on a topic which is essential for France, tax. And secondly, by leaving, he's making sure that France go bankrupt sooner rather than later. So we need the Gérard Gibardieu. We even need the Putins. We need the Podomas. We need the Zarissa, we need everything, because the problem is, politically, religiously, you all send the left, send the right. I can't tell the difference between your opinions. And why is that a problem? Well, because of the lack of diversity, because of the lack of discussion, privately, intellectually, you have more apps than you have opinions. And the problem with that is, of course, that when any society moves economically to a planned economy cycle, as we have done in the European Union, as we have done in the US, as we are increasingly doing Asia, and that we're certainly doing in Latin America. When more than 51% of the GDP, either directly or indirectly, comes from transfer of income from one pocket to another, the state to private, then you create a whole political class who rationally wants to do what? Nothing, because they benefit from the existing system. Everyone in this room below the age of 25 should be ashamed of themselves. You should be in the street throwing bricks. You should be revolutionizing against the world into which you have to work. Because society is in a total status quo exemplified by this uh, triangle. But the second one is the more important and the more economic one. And it's, if you only take one thing away from this speech, it, this is what you need to take away. Every single economy in the world is divided into the 80-20 rule. 20% of the economy is the listed company on the stock exchange and banks. And 80% is the main street, the average guy, the SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprises. So the reason why we can maintain this Bermuda Triangle of non-revolution, the social fabric being relatively stable despite the dismal economic times, is exactly that. It is the fact that we have an, an ability to move the needle because everything that's been done since this crisis started in 2007, 2008, has been towards the 20%. Quantitating easing, monetary policy, exclusively and only benefits the 20%, the banks and the listed companies. So in economic terms, the average stock-listed company in Europe right now has an input cost in terms of capital, which is two, 300 basis points lower than a normal business cycle. Meanwhile, the 80%, if they can access credit at all, pay 500, 800 basis points more than normal. And the bigger problem with that is that how many jobs do you think the 20% creates to the economy? Another big fat zero. So 100% of all jobs gets created in the SME sector. And inside the SME sector, 90% of all those jobs gets created in new startup, new businesses. Ironically, a country like France has one of the best startups schemes in the world. 
but God forbid you make money and you have to leave the country. So everything is about incentives or the lack of incentives. And the reason why we have this society of non-action, why Europe's crisis is there every single day. The systemic risk of Europe today is larger than it was before the crisis because quantitative easing itself has made every single local domestic bank borrow and buy, borrow from the ECB and buy domestic bonds. So when, when Greece, not if Greece, but when Greece leaves, there will be spillover effects. How much? I have no idea. So the 80-20 rule is also working in terms of the asset classes. You can see this is the return so far this year. The best performing stock markets happens to be Argentina, outside Europe, but otherwise Denmark, Portugal, Italy, Hungary, Frankfurt, Paris, Austria. At a time where we have no change in the underlying Europe economy. When you look at the crisis, the yellow is the CDS, or the insurance premium on Russia's debt. It's coming down. Apparently, we don't have a problem with Putin anymore. But as you can tell, we still have a problem with the Greeks. The Greek 10-year bonds, the only way you can measure the state of the crisis in Greece, has gone from 7% in August of last year to over 12%. And with the recent trip to Moscow, I think it's pretty clear that Syriza and uh, the Prime Minister have no intention of complying with anything EU, or for that matter, with the local uh, madame uh, around the corner from here. What we also have is for the 80% an ever lower inflation, lower, ever lower in, in interest rates, and to be honest, zero hope. As I said when I started, I predicted five of the last two crises, but I find when I come to a country right now, I'm the most optimistic economist they can find. So the mood is low, the expectations are extremely low, and 95% of anyone who ever asks me a question always questions the fact that anything will ever change. But I think that is a function of the relatively low uh, volatility we've seen in the marketplace, politically as well, relatively speaking to this wall of worry we continue to talk about. But what is interesting is that you need to learn about the nine-month rule. The nine-month rule is basically that there are three inputs to how an economy performs. The price of energy, the price of capital, and the currency rate. This, in an index form, shows the euro's growth input function since 2009, and as you can see, the boost we have received in Europe in input cost terms is 40% over the last year. But where is growth then? Things have stabilized, but where is the 2%, 2.5% growth for Europe? The problem is it takes a minimum of three, uh, 9 to 12 months before it comes into the economy. So you see, we started the, the actual move lower started in, August, in September, October, 9 plus 9 is 18, minus 12, so June, July will be roughly the time where you have the full impact of the significantly lower euro, the significantly lower energy price, and the significantly lower interest rates. I don't think interest rate on itself will do any big changes to the economy, but clearly energy will, because think about it, the one thing which is free of charge from a political point and also from an economic point is when energy prices go down, because all it is is a redistribution of wealth from crony oil-producing nations to the consumers. The problem is the consumers are not going to spend as much money as people expect, but still it's better than nothing. So in, in terms of where we are in Europe, it's clear to me that Greece will leave. I think the political tone has changed dramatically. The inability of Brussels to move the agenda forward in any aspect of the political and fiscal integration is there for anyone to see. I think it's concerning when the former president of the EU, in his State of the Union speech, uh, remarked, the problem with Europe is not that we have too much Europe, it is that we have too little Europe. I think that says everything about how far away 
Brussels is from the rest of Europe. We will also see, need to see a haircut in Greece, which means that the European taxpayer will have to pay for the German banks and the French banks being recapitalized. They will get away with it because no one cares anymore, no one understands. What is, however, a positive thing is that as you travel to Portugal, Spain, even Greece, to Eastern Europe, it's very clear that for the first time since the introduction of the euro in 99, Germany is now becoming uncompetitive relatively to these nations. Don't forget the whole introduction of the euro bought at no cost to Germany, them a competitive edge because their competitors couldn't devalue relative to them. The unit labor cost in Germany is one of the most expensive. Now, this year, Portugal and Spain becomes cheaper and we already see when people far outside Europe coming, incoming companies wants to start a factory or production, they don't start in Germany, they start in Portugal, they start in Spain, they start in Eastern Europe. This is good because when growth gets online from June, I think what you increasingly see is the sign we have already seen that Spain does better than the rest and all of the peripheral Europe will come back online. The problem in mathematical growth terms, of course, being that Spain doing well is not as good as Germany doing well. But as my driver told me going into the uh, hotel this morning, there's over a thousand building sites in Germany, so it's not like things are slowing down in Germany either. But I think we have a huge tectonic shift in Europe, which is good for Europe long term. Through the strategy of doing nothing, which by the way is my one strategy, for as an economist and as a politician. When I go to a country, I'm often asked, Steen, you can be president for one day. What would you do? And my answer is always the same. I'll do, I'll say, I will have only two things on my agenda. I will walk in and make my agenda to promise that I will do absolutely nothing for the whole period I'm in office. The second is, for every new law that is introduced under my presidency, two laws need to be taken away. But the fear of doing nothing is kind of not in our behavioral genes, is it? We have to be seen to be doing something. Belgium was without a government for two years. Do you know what happened to every single macroeconomic indicator? It improved. The most successful American president in growth terms, in fiscal surplus terms ever, was Bill Clinton. I don't know that Bill Clinton did anything except for smoking cigars for the eight years he was a president. He did try, but he didn't have the political ability to move the agenda. So doing nothing is very often the best strategy, because that respects the 2080 rule, because productivity, innovation, comes from the 80%. Not only do they create 100% of all jobs, they also create 100% of all productivity. So the reason that Europe has negative productivity, which the US also have, is actually exactly the same reason why we have zero interest rates, zero inflation, zero hope. The inability of this Bermuda Triangle of Economics to be shaken and taken apart. How it comes apart is, in my opinion, only through a major crisis. And if we leave Europe for one minute and look to the US, it's absolutely clear to me that the Federal Reserve will hike interest rate, and for the first time in Fed history, not because the economic condition warrants it, but merely because they want to have an indicate to the market that asset inflation is becoming an issue. The handover of leadership to Yellen, and more importantly to the Vice Chairman, Stanley Fisher is a clear indication that asset inflation is an issue. So there will be a margin call on asset inflation in the US and later also in Europe. The catalyst will be the dollar. Since the crisis started, the amount of dollar debt in the world has increased from $4 trillion to $8 trillion, most of it in Asia, which means when the dollar goes stronger, everybody lose. A journalist recently asked me, who benefits from a stronger dollar? I couldn't, as often is the case, answer the question. But I realized five minutes after, there isn't an answer, because no one benefits from a strong dollar. 
That's why 2015 is lost for growth for Europe and the rest. But Europe will do better because of the nine-month rule I just gave you. There will be a move towards a bank union, but Europe has never been more challenged than it is today, not because of Greece, but because of the UK election that comes in May. Next year, we will probably have a referendum on the UK status. And don't forget, UK is the anger in Europe. They are exactly what I talked about before. They are the, the other side of the argument every single time Europe wants to do more. Denmark, Sweden, even Germany is depending on the UK to say no. If they leave, not only will it impact the financial market, but it will also impact the political process in Brussels. Don't forget the best kingdoms in history even may have had a strong king, but they also had a strong opposition. And I think in an institute like today, under the headlines you operate today, I would like to remind you all that Dispectually disagreeing is the best thing that is in life. There's no point in being in this room and agreeing with all of you that Iran is great and liberty stands and will rule and low taxes and bitcoins or whatever has been on the agenda. To be honest, I'm old enough, seasoned enough, I don't give a shit, to be honest. But what I want you to do is to be forcefully arguing your case. But at all times, remember, it is not about being right, it's about having the best practice, it's about the ability of moving productivity and innovation. We have created a society, the reason you are so boring, that is only thinking about buying the next dividend stock that pays 4% yield and not investing in money. The expected return for the stock market for the next three, five, and seven years is another big fat zero. So if you want to make money, take it from a hedge fund manager, trader, then you have to invest in people, in education, in yourself, but at all times with an openness that you can, you can be wrong. I think a lot of the conversations that happens in the world today are one-sided. I think all of the political argument is based on saying no and disagreeing with what someone just stated. There is too little ambition. I want you to be more ambitious. I want countries to be more ambitious. I very often get invited to give political parties advice. Unfortunately, I never get invited back twice to the same party. But what I always tell them is the same. Believe in people. Believe in the 80-20 rule. Support only the 80%. Forget about the 20%. They are politically, economically strong enough to take care of themselves. Make sure that the state does exactly what the private state cannot do but also accept that the state has a role. The hospital system should not be privatized. The energy system can be privatized, but it has to be owned by the country so you can lease it. I think there is a best practice in every single thing in life, and I think we are, as economists, and even people who are policymakers, are making things way too complicated. It's about you taking risk, forgetting being bankers, and going into the real world, investing in small businesses, startups up, and going forward. So, the status of Euro crisis is that we're nowhere. We're going nowhere until we get a full-blown crisis. I've been hoping Greece would be that catalyst for the last five years, but no one gives a toss about Greece anymore, to be honest. I used to be asked all the time, what is you going to do about Greece? Now people want to know what we're going to do about Russia. The whole Russia situation is going to be Worse, I go to Russia two, three times a year. I love Russia. I think it's one of the best investments right now if you want to make a, an option, a cheap, cheap play for the next 10 years. But I think energy-wise, politically, we're doing exactly the wrong thing. We pretend to know, Russia pretends to know, and nowhere is there this ability to disagree on agreeing. So my hope for Europe is that doing nothing, my political program, seems to be working in Spain, it's certainly working in Portugal. I think it is working to some extent across Europe because through doing nothing for so long, Germany has become uncompetitive, and that's probably the best thing that could happen to Europe, because Germany not using its massive current account is a big issue. 
especially internally with the dynamics in Europe. But make no mistakes, I am a big optimist on Europe. I'm not a big optimist on EU. I think EU will be redefined. I think the euro will exist also in 20 years and in 30 years, but it will be a different euro. And I think most importantly, I think it's about time you guys wake up and become politically active. If not politically active, you need to spend the money when you get them in buying into productivity innovation, because buying all those apps is not going to make you happy. So I'll say what I found on the A-Life. May your life be someday as awesome as you pretend it is on Facebook. <laughs> and of course I say that with a smile, but I think it is reality today. We are so busy, even policymakers, updating our political status on Facebook that we forget to have the conversation, the provocation I hopefully have given you. I think engaging each other in disagreeing is everything. And I think today, over the next couple of days, you have to be careful not to agree too much with each other. I hope someone will stand up and say, this is rubbish in two seconds when I'm done. Thank you very much, everybody. OK, thank you for this interesting talk, Mr. Jakobsen. I think we have time for Q&A. Here's one. Um, hi, thank you for your speech. Uh, I have uh, one economical question I think you might be a good person to ask and uh, one just a personal statement I want to say. I'll start with the second one that, um, you know, to go to a conference where people from all over Europe come together to talk about how we can solve society's problems and then say like, oh, you should be ashamed of yourselves. Uh, I find it quite offensive. Um, right? My question is, um, when will the American economy collapse or the European econo economy collapse? And what signs would you look for to see if that's going to happen? I heard uh, somebody say, like, uh, when the Fed is going to raise interest rates in the US, then that's a sign to look out for that uh, uh, high, uh, like hyperinflation is going to happen or something. Um, what would you look out for in Europe? Like, what would be the first sign that uh, things are falling apart or something? Thank you. First of all, I'm sorry if I offended you. It wasn't uh, intended. I admit, but by the way, I'm offending everybody I meet uh, in my 200 uh, speeches a year. That is the point. My point is to offend you, actually. And the fact you are offended is good. <laughs> because, no, no, don't get me wrong. Don't, don't applaud me for that, certainly. But I, but I think I need, to, I need to offend you, because it seems like the only way we can get that conversation going is by, by offending. My point here is to get 200, 500 people together who all agree that liberty is a fine thing is, is a good thing. But we should have had someone representative of the opposite side, someone who was against it, the broader spectrum. So I, I concur, I agree. We even sponsor you having this arrangement as a bank. So don't get me wrong. I'm all for openness. I'm all for open society, for discussion. But I don't want it to be one-sided. I hate to be in a dinner party where everybody agrees. That is my point, so uh, I'm sorry if I offended you. In terms of what people tell you, I have one word, bollocks. You cannot, I mean, if, if, you, if you want to do analysis on economics, you need to, to give you a few pointers. First of all, everything in economics is lead lag. So think of economics like sinus curve. The interest rate has a certain sinus curve. Exchange has a sinus curve. Uh, energy price has a sinus curve. Uh, equity market has a sinus curve. In an average year, half of them go up, half of them go down. That's why there are so many idiotic e economists in the world, because they make for a big fat zero, right? Once in a while, the sinus curve, 90% of them go down, and sometimes 90% of them go up. What's unique about 15, to some extent late 14 and early 16, is that this is the time where 90% of all these sinus curves, waves I'm measuring are going down. It doesn't mean it's a collapse, it doesn't mean that it's society is breaking up. It means that you are offended by me and then you do something and you react as you did. It means that people are rising to the occasion. For the first time, I go to Australia twice a year. Three years ago, they almost exported me out of the country because I was so negative on the economy. I came back this time, now I'm the most positive economist without having changed my view. 
So I'm just telling you that the sinus curve of Australia is all the way at the low end, ready to go the other way. So if you want to make money, if you want to make economic projections, find your sinus curve, work with them in an econometric way, but also realize they will always come up again. So there will not be a fallout, a breakout. Greece is not big enough to be significant. It's big enough to create political turmoil. And that's the second lesson. If you have timelines, a good old Facebook thing, you should have more than one timeline. You have the Marcus timeline, you have the average guy's timeline, you have the political timeline. Markets is always instantaneous. The average guy is three months behind, and politics is nine months behind. So the problem when we talk and we talk past each other, when we don't have communication, is really that we don't have the same timeline. I mean, politicians are always nine months behind. Central banks are always nine months behind. So circling back to your, your, your input to Fed hiking interest rate, if Fed does hike interest rate, it is the most televised advance notice ever given in history because they have been threatening to hike interest rate for the past six years. And they will have to just look at a curve. They add zero. So we'll have to go to, to, um, to have to go up. So no, that would not be the case. It would be the lack of reforms that we see. And that is the, the takeaway I have economically from 35 countries. Everywhere I go, there's been no reforms. There's been no ability to get anyone to be accountable. There's no new movements towards the 80-20 rule. But in all places, people keep telling me in six months' time things will be better. It's just not the economic reality. Hello, I'm Martin. Um, I wonder what the basis of your optimism is because so far Brussels and <clears throat> the politicians have have seemed to be very determined to actually continue with Greece in the Eurozone and with the same direction of the European Union and of all these institutions and we know from history that the Soviet Union kept going on for years after the famines and stuff and the EU is not as bad as the, uh, as the Soviet Union, so I think it can go on for decades. So what is your source of optimism here? Thank you. It's, it's on, up here. It is, the mar it is basically very short energy. Energy being 50% lower means that everyone's getting more disposable income. It's a transformation of, uh, it's a redistribution of money from, uh, from sovereign wealth to consumers. And even politicians can't screw that up. Um, and the optimism is also, think about it, what can, what, what can get worse? Greece leaving will be good for Greece, will be good for Europe. Uh, so, so I hate that argument because it's always like, you know, if we hadn't done this, it would have been different. No, it would have been much better uh, in, in pretty much every single case. I think everything that happens in life, even your question is like, you know, Einstein's definition of, uh, of being uh, of insanity, right? Keep repeating the same experiment, expecting different results. My point is that you have deprived the productivity, the production capital, the average guy, the wage income earner of any ability to do anything for the last five years. I think there is a watershed moment where money starts to flow from the 20% to the 80% because exactly that the expected return is zero. And I promise you, you're going to make zero return if you buy an average stock market for the next five years with the present valuation. So ultimately, money yielding zero will have to flow to productivity, to innovation. And when people get activated, think about an unemployment queue and the cost of society. When you have one person who's unemployed, you have to pay him benefits, he gets more sick, he t takes... Uh, state has to support him more than just the, the subsidy of whatever welfare system you have. Now you activate him and get him to work. Not only does he not cost you money as a society, he is less sick, he has a better sex life, he will move out from uh, his mom and he will buy an apartment, you will have the whole recirculation going through. So what I'm pointing out is that the, when growth comes back from the 20%, investing in 20% goes into the 80%, you will have exponential growth. Make no mistakes, there is so much. It's not like you are not smarter. You are smarter than ever, you're just not very productive. But you will be productive when you're forced to be productive. In terms of technology, quantum computing is, 
I sat next to the chairman of uh, the only, I think, European quantum computer company the other day. He said, inside two to three years, quantum computing is coming online for us to buy, to actually access. Imagine the, the scope of which we can, iterations, uh, healthcare innovation we can do. We've just been in a unique period where you have been so boring updating your Facebook profiles that you have not been productive. The incentive structure of society through this planned economy and the EU, going back to your initial uh, in input, has you know, made sure that everyone has been buying the illusion that things are good. Forget about macro. And as I said in this one, I've done 30 years of economics and I realize I know nothing, which is, I guess, is some realization. But in any society that doesn't have growth, there's too much macro. There's too many people who think they know what's going on, the EU being your example. The micro in Switzerland, in, even in parts of China, in every single economy I go to, whether I'm in Argentina, South Africa, some of the biggest basket places in the world, I always meet CEOs, people who are willing to work and commit and be credible. That is my hope. So my hope, despite my offending you all, is I have infinite hope in you guys, and I have infinite disbelief in public system and macro. Uh, hello, uh, I would like to ask you about uh, you mentioned that you're not very satisfied with the Germany's performance. I would like to ask you if, if it's the question, like, what can be do done about it? Because in the end, Germany, um, like right now, situation in the EU is, is pretty tough. Everyone is trying to, um, let's say, protect themselves instead of protecting the whole system. And uh, due to uh, twin deficits, to kind of uh, German economic colonization of other countries. I think the question is more like what can be done about it uh, because the th things that are going on for Germany right now with G G Germany's policy, it's in favor of Germany and no one can force them to change their policy just like this and what can be done about it. So you know my political platform, do nothing. And I think you should do nothing. I think it's for Germany to make all the mistakes they're making right now underinvestment in infrastructure, not make it your, your after-school program for women so they can't participate is one of the worst in the world. Even Japan has better conditions than women in Germany for working after one o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, Germany is doing all the mistakes. They're complacent, they think they're extremely competitive. But what they are, they are extremely competitive, very select sectors. They are the best. Germany is a great country, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not on the side of, uh, actually I'm more German uh, being Danish than I'm anything, so I'm very pro-Germany. But I, I'm not gonna tell Germany what to do. I think the only way they're gonna do and change is through failing, and they will fail, because the unit labor cost in Germany is going up 4% every year. The unit labor cost in Portugal, Poland, uh, whatever is less than 1%. So 3%, the rule of 72 divided by 3 tells you how much it will take for double the price, right? So, so Germany in the next 20 years will just gradually get worse and worse. You will not, if you ask the average German, you will not be able to see it. But you'll be able to see it on the current account, you'll be able to see it on productivity, you'll be able to see of the, the, the social welfare, the demographics is negative. So Germany needs to wake up. I mean, Germany should not spend more money because someone tells them to. They should do it because you have a crap airport at Berlin that you need to improve. You have an infrastructure which is, is you know, with potholes and, and whatever. You need to do better. The energy is a joke in Germany. I mean, you know, I'm no energy expert, but uh, deciding one day to the next that you're not going to have atomic power because of Japan is pretty irrational in my opinion. And you, your, your closing down program is one of the most expensive in the world. Do you realize Germany trying to be the most green in the world is actually the worst performer in the Toyota protocol. Ironic, right? And the best, by the way, is the US who hasn't even signed it because of uh, shell gas. So I'm just, again, that shows you how can the US be the best and Germany the worst when Germany has a proactive policy and US has a non-policy? It is exactly because they're doing nothing in, in the US. Shell gas created this lower uh, environmental. So the answer is they should do nothing. Germany needs to fail and make their own mistakes. Uh, but if they wake up one day uh, around uh, these quarters, they should do infrastructure investment. They should liberate the, the, they should work far more on the labor market. They should make sure they don't grow the unit labor cost at 4% a year. Okay. Uh, do you think that the uh, European Union made a mistake of making euro as a single currency? 
uh, the value of euro can be the same in different countries because of different economic power of countries. It's unsustainable, I, I think. And the second question is, uh, do you think that uh, EU institutions are too bu bureaucratic and pressing the individual liberties? Uh, politicians are, are so incapable. On, on the first question, uh, I was part of the, uh, my, my professor at university wrote the law committee report, so I was part of that study group. It's absolutely clear that the mistake that was made with the euro was not the euro itself, but the fact there wasn't a political and fiscal union from the start. Something that was in the law committee as a recommendation, something the Germans pushed, but which Mitterrand uh, said, we will wait to do that for when we need to do it. So the question as a good economist is yes and no. Uh, but understand that you build a house without a foundation, ultimately when the, the storm comes, it can test the, uh, the, the house. But, but the problem with the euro is not the, it's not the euro concept or the euro idea, it is the construction. You cannot have, and, and, and economic theory, uh, uh, history, remember, there's not even the most simplistic monetary union has ever survived. Now, before anyone says the U.S., uh, please give me a, give me a break. Uh, so, so even the, the, the most primitive German lender couldn't do it. As soon as you have the headwind in terms of economic condition, it gets worse. I mean, think about the political power in Europe has gone from, you had the U.K., you had France, and you had Germany sort of agreeing. Then you had France and Germany. Now you have Germany agreeing with themselves. And going back to what I said a few times, Germany agreeing with itself is not good. Not because I'm against Germany, because just because any system that is monopolistic, uh, mono in culture, is wrong. By definition, because you become what? Complacent, going back to the other gentleman's question. Germany is, in my opinion, Germany is the most complacent politically, economic uh, country in the world right now, uh, in, in, in Europe, sorry. Um, everyone else is on the, the edge of the sea trying to do something to change. And the second question was the uh, political ability, right? <laughs> That's an easy, yes. <laughs> my, my position on Europe is very clear. I'm a European, I believe in Europe, I believe in, in, in free movement. I think it's a great thing in terms of the initial idea. I think everything beyond that, the whatever, uh, Strasbourg, uh, Brussels, uh, uh, Luxembourg, all of that is just a waste of time, big time waste of time. But the problem is, I can disagree with it, I, I could do whatever I want. You have to remember the one lesson we've learned about the EU. There are far more, far more political capital and money invested in the EU than in anything else. It is the single biggest investment politically by anyone which is scary in my opinion. That is the real discussion. Why do we have this? I mean, lots of things in Europe are good, but, uh, but we don't even have an internal market. We have building codes that are different in every single country we have. You know, a lot of it is just PR, spinning, spinning, spinning around. Okay, last question. Thank you, thank you for your speech. You said the UK was the voice of a no in uh, the EU. Uh, what do you think of David Cameron's pledge to reform or have a referendum uh, in 2017? And do you think that even he is re-elected uh, soon, which, not, which doesn't appear so likely, uh, will he be able to obtain reform? So, of course, the, the whole EU Tory party backbenchers has been calling for this vote forever, of course. Uh, at the end of the day, I think the, the British are Europeans, although they will hate to admit it. The problem you have right now is that on any given day next year, if there is a referendum election on, on UK, if Chelsea has lost and Manchester United has won, it could go the wrong way, right? Uh, it's that close. The UK party is potent. Uh, the Scottish nationals are potent. Uh, I mean, the Scottish nationals are going to have a, serious, a, a dramatic impact on the building of governments. I think they are last last poll had them at 40 or 50 uh, seats uh, in Parliament. So what I think is going on in the UK that the two two tier party is becoming a four tier five part tier party. Uh, and, and that will open some interesting questions. I personally think the UK referendum, potentially next year, is the biggest challenge to the Europe uh, ever. Uh, because exactly on the wrong day, with the, uh, with the wrong football results over the weekend, this can turn very nasty. 
And I don't think anyone can even begin to imagine what it would mean to have UK outside. Um, so, so, so on that basis, but, but I am, I have to say, I am a European. I believe in, you know, we should be able to move around without passports. We should be able to take a job anywhere we want, because that's the only way we make sure that Europe is competitive. There's a lot of good things in Europe but that, that, that we, we tend to, to ignore on a daily basis. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the uh, day. Giga T. Crowdfunding for you and me.